the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created humans and other animals and protected them in a garden of delights where they would be safe and remain kept under his grace. Adam and Eve enjoyed God's protection and behaved as honored guests until the arrival of the malicious snake who would tempt Eve to eat the fruit of knowledge. In the end, among the fiery remains of Surtur's army and the melted armor of millions of the Dacer, a man and a woman will emerge from the womb of Yggdrasil, the World Tree. They will find a world in ruins, broken by a war of titanic proportions. These two humans, Lif and Lithrasir, would be tasked by the remaining gods to repopulate the world and spin anew the wheel of history. Welcome to Epic Tales, where we look for answers in the legends of our past. Ragnarok and Genesis seem to be polar opposites in the realm of myth. While it is somewhat common for the mythical traditions to have creation and destruction myths in it, it is odd to find such a similar comparison that reflects the proximity between two cultures. How is it possible? How could it be that the Norse tragedy and twilight of the gods align so well with the beginning of the world in Abrahamic tradition? The first aspect to analyze is whether the Norse mythology contemplated any future after Ragnarok. Was the end of the world expected to have a continuation? The answer to this question is an indubitable yes. Ancient Norse tradition had a cyclical understanding of history and time. The past itself was a distant future. One turn of the wheel away. Odin, after sacrificing himself to himself in his pursuit of knowledge, gained great foresight and certain premonitory abilities. He understood the concept of the iterative nature of his reality, and so the inevitable nature of Ragnarok. Odin was terrified of this fact, for in a way, he spent his entire life with Fenris' jaws around him, gaping wide at each step. By some analysis, Odin was even capable of predicting the future after his own death, and some scholars believe that what the Old Father whispered in Baldur's ear was a confirmation of the son's resurrection after Ragnarok. So the connection of a new genesis, a new beginning, after Ragnarok makes sense from the Norse perspective. From a literary and historical perspective, the idea of the new Christian genesis following the twilight of the old Norse gods also checks out. The only two texts that have reads or days which contain the old Norse stories are the prose and poetic Eddas. The prose Edda, the most detailed account of these stories, was written down by a 13th century scholar named Snorri Sturluson. Now, it's important to mention that by the 13th century, Norway had largely been Christianized, and the old ways were dying out. So, in an effort to preserve these oral tales, Snorri gathered them in his prose Edda. It is also believed by many scholars that Snorri also added and tweaked some stories based on his personal taste and his objective to bring traditional Norse myth more in line with the Christian predominant religion. It is not completely wrong to expect that Snorri made use of the concept of cyclical history that the Norse believed in and included and weaved the Christian genesis into the loose ends left by Ragnarok. That way, the last two humans, Lift and Lifthrasir, would easily be mistaken for a Norse name Adam and Eve. Finally, for a thematic perspective, we can see a lot of similarities among the myth of creation and the myth of destruction of Christianity and Norse myth. Here are some highlights. Both a man and a woman are kept alive to explain the fact that in our days, humans still exist. Both are kept in a garden, 
protected by a god from a world impure and in fire. Finally, it is said that Lift and Liftrasir would drink the morning dew hanging from a tree, which would give them the strength and wit to wander the new world, as Adam and Eve would be nourished prior to their departure. Now, in the sake of fairness, we must also consider all the things that do not fit. Be this because Snorri did not think of them, or perhaps some other cause, such as words changing meaning across time, blurring the original meaning. There are some loose ends in this story. The first issue stems from all the other Norse gods that survive Ragnarok. Hönir, Magni, Modi, Njord, Vidar, Vali, and Hödr, as well as Baldur, are still alive, or are resurrected by the time the Prosedda concludes. The Old Testament, however, is clear that there is but one God in the world, and makes no reference to any other being left alive from a previous pantheon. The second issue that Snorri could have not contemplated is that by considering the cyclical nature of history in the Nordic perspective and tying Ragnarok to Genesis, it is inferred that the Christian God will give away eventually to a new version of the Nordic pantheon. This perspective is of course never addressed in either the Old or the New Testaments, but it's simply if Odin was right in believing history to be a wheel, and Ragnarok an inevitability, then the Christian god must either become a Nordic deity or be supplanted by one. Having considered all of these theses, it is quite likely that Snorri's intention was to marry Nordic tradition with modern Christianity. However, the scholar that he was, he might have been so enamored with the stories of the old Norse pantheon that he dare not change much to accommodate his objectives. However, the parallelisms between Genesis and the conclusion of Ragnarok are and will remain a fascinating tale of comparative mythology and analysis. Thank you so much for listening to Epic Tales and hope you join us for our future videos.